it's good to see everyone. And um, not all of you had a chance to meet uh, Marissa, but Marissa Jablonski, you'll see her, her picture on here too. She's there and she's our guest speaker this evening. So before we start out um, with, with our topic of the night, we just wanna have a few of our action updates um, of what's going on with our local group and, and um, things that we can do. So we have our ongoing Fridays for Future actions at the Chase Bank and we've moved to the downtown location now that the winter winds have gone away and we can tolerate water in Wisconsin a little bit better. Um, and uh, so even though sometimes it's a little windy down there, at least it's warm. And um, we're meeting there at 12 noon again on Fridays at Water in Wisconsin. And every other Friday, um, just approximately every other Friday, yes, we've been joining forces with the Milwaukee and the Wars Coalition and, um, and meeting at 11 at the congressional offices that are nearby. And the last one we met with was at um, Senator Johnson's office. And now this coming Friday, this week, we'll be meeting at uh, Tammy Baldwin's office, which is on 7th in Wisconsin. And some people like to you know, walk from 7th in Wisconsin back down to water at Chase Bank. Others, you know, you can move your car. I found the parking very, very easy on that intersection of 7th and Wisconsin. It's just, I've never had trouble finding a spot in a couple of car spot, uh, spaces from the corner. So uh, that's pretty easy to do. And um, then we deliver statements to the staff of, of these offices um, asking the um, senators or the congresswoman, <clears throat> one more being the congresswoman that's um, right downtown there, to, um, first of all, to vote to, cu to cut military spending and fund human needs and climate solutions. And then we also are asking them to join the Democratic Party Council on Environment and Climate Crisis. And um, then um, it's important to, to note right now that Biden has requested a whole bunch more money like 30 billion some more dollars for this coming year's Pentagon budget. So it's up to 813 billion that he has requested for the Pentagon budget, plus tens of billions of dollars are being added on to that um, in um, uh, proposals from both the House and the Senate. The House proposing another 37 billion on top of Biden's request and the Senate of another 45 billion on top of, of uh, the request that Biden had to increase the spending. So in response to this continuously, ex almost exponentially growing Pentagon budget, it's just got so out of control um, that uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee and our own Congressman Mark Pocan from the Madison area uh, have offered an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act um, to reduce military spending by $100 billion. And we would like to have you call um, Congresswoman Moore, Gwen Moore's office, uh, if you could do that even tomorrow, because this week they may be voting on some of these proposals but to ask her to definitely support uh, Barbara Lee and Mark uh, Pocan's um, proposal to cut the military budget by $100 billion. And um, then of course, next week, I mean, next month on August 9th is when we meet again. And that's also election day for a primary. So be sure to vote before you come to the meeting. It's really awesome. We emphasize over and over again how important it is to, to make our voice heard. If, either, if you don't vote, you may lose the opportunity forever. So the, um, then there's also something coming up that Greg wanted to talk about, which was the July 27th rally at We Energies. Greg, could you? talk about who's sponsoring that and what, what it's all about. 
Well, that's essentially the Clean Power Coalition of Southeast Wisconsin, uh, July 27th, about 12 noon. Uh, we're gonna be having a press event at Seiler Park across from uh, WEX headquarters. And really the focus is the uh, delay that they recently announced at uh, the Oak Creek Power Plant, uh, the delay in closing the, uh, the coal part of that and uh, what the impacts that are gonna be on communities. So that's being put together, just uh, uh, heads up. So more information to follow. And what day of the week is that on July 27th? It's uh, Wednesday. On a Wednesday. And do you know the time? At 12 noon. 12 noon. Okay, thank you. I can write that one down. And then uh, Jan, could you tell us about this uh, Chicago Day of Action as a regional event that's being planned in Chicago for September 23rd? Yes, um, we've been in discussions with 350 Madison and Chicago. They would like us to join them all for an event in Chicago. That's, um, I haven't seen the area, but apparently BP's uh, pipeline headquarters, Chase Bank and the Federal Reserve are all located right, right within a few blocks of each other. And so we're, uh, going to go there and there will, there will be a bus so you don't have to drive. They said they would swing by and pick us up in Milwaukee. And there's going to be a dance too, if you care to join, but you don't have to. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really cool though, if you wanna watch the video that Greg put out on the newsletter. Um, yeah. You can just hold signs if you want people, and, you, and if you wanna get dressed up or whatever, but you don't have to do that. But it, so it's at 11, 11 o'clock till one. And um, said we apparently there's a little nice little plaza in front of Chase Bank, which is great for performing, and and also going to do a die in there and everything. So it should hopefully generate a lot of interest. And um, they would like to say anybody that can make it to Chicago to join them that day. Great, thank you. So um, yeah, and as, as Jan said, the. The bus that'll be starting in Madison will swing through Milwaukee and pick up people here. Maybe there would be some people from the Racine Kenosha area that can hop on the bus when we pass through there and end up in Chicago for the day. Um, that's uh, so we don't have to drive and just can get to know people on the bus and have a uh, good yeah, time. It, it should be a fun event and yeah, hopefully it should be good. garner a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Great, and that is on a Friday. So, it is on a Friday, right? Yes, yeah. September 23rd. September 23rd. Okay, so, so people who can't go for that full day could still meet at Chase Bank here, as we usually would on a Friday. But we'll try to get as many people as we can down there to join the Chicago crowd. And I know they're looking to have a couple hundred people, I think, aren't they? Yeah, that, that's yeah. the goal. Too. Right, right. Okay. And then uh, I was saying to Greg earlier that it's really good to have some good resources as to um, finding the latest data and the latest information, the latest news on climate issues. And I myself get um, the Inside Climate News a newsletter sent to me on, a, I think it's on a weekly basis. And that's really good because you can just kind of skim through it and skim through the headlines and see which ones you want to plug into. And, and it um, keeps you up to date on a lot of issues um, on climate news. And so then I said, well, what other ones do you suggest, Greg? And he, had, he said, right on our website, there's um, our 350 Milwaukee website. There's, uh, you can click on more news and then you click on under there on climate online. Is that correct, Greg? I think it's- Yep, that's yep. correct. Yep. And there, there you'll find a whole list of good sources of news. Um, some of them are newspapers uh, like The Guardian or New York Times or stuff that have special climate sections. Um, some are, are uh, it, well, for example, magazines like Scientific American. Um, there's just a lot of variety. You must have listed off about a dozen for me, Greg, when we were talking. So I would suggest that you take a look at that and you can just keep up to date and do your own research. Oh, there's one thing else before we get into, the, into our um, talk uh, that I wanted to mention. 
how many of you are getting these junk mails from Chase Bank? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. just okay. got one this week. <laughs> oh, don't throw it away. These are very <laughs> useful, okay? This is an action item. <laughs> um, it says that they will give you $225 to open an account with them. And so what I have done before, and I'm doing it again, is I write a message. They also are very kind to leave a lot of white space. So you can write them a little letter. And mine says, uh, oh, thank you so much for the generous offer of $225. But however, I cannot do business with Chase Bank as long as it continues to finance the fossil fuel development and production. Currently, Chase is the number one funder of fossil fuel in the world. With the planet on the brink of climate chaos, I ask that you appeal to the Chase directors to change this policy. Sincerely, and I sign my name, Julie Enzo. Now, before I've, I've used these and I've taken them into the bank and I've gone, it was a branch bank, and I went up to a teller and I handed this to him and I said, oh, I just wanted, you know, I just received this in the mail. And of course, he thought I was going to open an account. He was very excited. <laughs> but, but then I explained why I was not going to open an account. And I gave this to him and, and uh, read him the message and asked him to pass this on to their, man, their bank manager. And um, I just wanted him to know. And I said, and by the way, there's several of us outside demonstrating um, on this issue. And that's why we're here. So I'm going to be doing that again at another Chase Bank. And I, I, found, I got another one in the mail. So I'll do it at another Chase Bank. And, but many of us can do that. You don't have, you know, just stroll in and go talk to one of the tellers and give them your line and hand them this with your little message on it. And you've got an action right there. That's, that's, hopefully... that's a great idea. And it's a good way to recycle junk mail, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm true. Greg, take over. Introduce our speaker. Thank you. Our guest tonight, Dr. Marissa Jablonski is an engineer, an educator, a founding member and mentor to the UWM student chapter of Engineers Without Borders. She's also the executive director of the Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin, and that's only naming a few of her pursuits. On the list of accomplishments, her list of accomplishments are working around the world with developing communities on projects to ensure that people have safe access to clean water. She's worked on policy at USAID in Washington, D.C., both in the Office of American Schools and Hospitals Abroad and in the Office of Food for Peace. She worked in Thailand to uh, cut single-use plastics out of their hotels. And I urge you to uh, go to the meeting uh, information from tonight, and you can find links to her TED Talks on that, at that location. She's an advocate for uh, minorities and women in STEM fields and a whole lot more. Um, as it's described on the UWM site, uh, Marissa lives her life as part of a global community. So let's welcome, welcome uh, Dr. Marissa Jablonski, please. Hey. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for the nice introduction, Greg. I really, I'm really honored to be here. I've, I've heard about your organization I get your emails actually. I don't, I'm so sorry that I don't have the time to, to participate, at, um, but a couple of my students have in the past and that makes me really happy and proud. So, so I think what you're doing is terrific and I'm so excited to be here. So now I will um, share my screen. Here we go. Okay. So today we are going to talk about plastics single-use plastics, plastics reduction, and you. And I also almost snuck in the title, but I couldn't change the title super last minute, but I wanted it to be, um, and industry, right? Because the, the more we talk about environmental pollution and environmental degradation, we realize that there really is a corporate responsibility in there too, that often isn't talked about enough because we may not be able to do something directly that makes a big change, but we'll see, we'll see. There's lots to do. 
So as Greg described, I have traveled all over the world and worked in, in many countries in Asia and Africa and uh, Central and South America and North America. And never have I ever met anyone who wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm going to pollute. And yet pollution happens, right? So uh, so I start with this because I think we need to wrap our minds around something that I live by. One of the mantras is that everyone, absolutely everyone, I have to say this to myself to stay sane, is doing their best. Some people's best is not very good, but it is still their best. So since we know more, we'll do more. And that's that's hopefully one of the outcomes of this talk. I also, much like you, I'm sure, was born an environmentalist. One of my very first memories is standing on the shores of this great lake that most likely most of us are near, Lake Michigan, looking out and thinking this, this is the center of the universe. This is the most important thing ever I could tell at age, I, I don't exactly know, but somewhere between two and three. And thinking we need to respect this, we need to work with this, we need to protect this, we need to do everything around this. And so uh, needless to say, I got my undergrad in environmental science because I wanted to save the world and then went back for a master's and a PhD. That's actually how I met Charles. I was working on my PhD, one of your members, uh, and uh, working on environmental engineering because I felt that environmental science was observing all the problems and I wanted to take action. Needless to say, it turns out engineers often react to problems rather than uh, again, rather than take action. And so all of the work that I've ever done is really that I'm very proud of, let's say, is action oriented and forward thinking. And I think it goes without saying, I'll, I, I have a feeling that most of you on this call have felt something inside while you're fighting for the environment, or uh, if we don't want to call it fighting, let's say, working with planet earth you might feel anger frustration anxiety all of these things so sometime when i was in high school into my undergrad uh, i started feeling quite angry actually and uh, i'm also a maker so i make things with textiles specifically uh, knitting and sewing and designing. And so I had heard about, maybe some of you recognize this large quilt by Therese Agnew. It's called Textile, um, sorry, Portrait of a Textile Worker. But she came, I'll bet you it's 15 years ago now. She came to Madison to, um, to unveil this amazing quilt. And it is probably 10 feet tall by about 14 feet wide, something like that. And it is made of thousands of tags in clothing. And this was the first time that I had really connected with an artist and a textile worker and uh, around uh, an environmental and social and economic issue like sweatshops. I had been angry about sweatshops since I heard about them in high school. And so I went to see this unfolding of the quilt and was floored. And there stood Therese Agnew saying, I'm so angry about sweatshops. And I thought, I'm angry too. And she said, and I take these long walks and I try to get to the bottom of the anger. And so I created this quilt from that anger. And from these long walks and hours and hours of sewing and putting this quilt together, I've come to realize that at the beginning of my anger is love. And, and it is love for humanity and love for people and love for things. And this has been... Uh, a cornerstone of my life. Most of what I do does come from anger, if I'm being quite honest with, with you all. And then when I follow that anger all the way back, it comes from love, just like Teresa Agnew said. So I, I sit before you today as an environmentalist, just like all of you, to say that um, my love, and I'm, sh I'm sure there's overlap here, I love clean air, clean water, clean soil. And especially, I love when people are treated well, and when they have these things surrounding them and around them so that they can live happy, healthy lives. 
the, where they their dreams can come true. So I'm going to now split you up. Let's not though. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think, I wonder, is there an opinion? Because um, we were going to split up into groups and answer the question, what is behind your anger? But we, there's about 10 of us. How about we do it in the in the big group? Yep, we got some nods. Okay, sure. and and just freely share. Otherwise, we can call on people. But the idea will just take about five minutes and we'll hear from everybody what is behind your anger and um and you can even define your anger sometimes that helps go for it please i would say that for me the concept of injustice and just the fact that we're destroying things without really thinking about the future and what's so so that's your anger so then what's behind it? Obviously, I mean, maybe justice, right? But um, yeah. yeah, but what do you love? Let's, let's ask that question even, even clearer. Like, what do you love, Michael? Well, truth is, I, I think probably mainly truth, but also just the concept of justice, yeah. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Leah, you were unmuted before. Do you wanna share? Um, I, can I have another minute? Of course you can. Thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think how to put this together. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what makes me angry is the inertia mm -hmm. of human beings. This is really the big picture part of that. And that we can't and, and, and I know that there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, uh, different viewpoints of what's really going on in the world by different people, but it's maybe f more frustrating than it is anger, but um, it, it makes me crazy uh, many days. And so then flip it. So then what do you love? Well, I do love the fact that there are people who are actually trying to make a difference. I have a very skewed view, especially in the last uh, five or 10 years, because I talk to and interface with, and, and maybe that's not true. It's my whole life. I interact and interface with people who have uh, not dissimilar views. And certainly the group of people that I've been interacting with in the last five or 10 years has changed especially around the uh, around climate. So in a sense, I live in kind of a bubble. And, uh, and, and, and so I, you know, I enjoy meeting and talking to a lot of people with, uh, with similar views. And uh, also enjoy meeting and discussing things with people with divergent views. Uh, however, those uh, conversations often aren't quite as um, pleasant. So maybe action. You you love to see action towards environmental sustainability, environmental protection, that kind of thing, right? So because that's what you're that's what you're expressing. That's what you're a part of. Mm -hmm. Just an idea. I don't know. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, yeah, that's and it, it's beyond, beyond just environmental and climate, but uh, sure, yeah, a lot. And there's so many things going on in the world that have. Uh, capable people working on them, fortunately, because there's so many injustices in the world that uh, no one has time to address them all. Yeah. Charles, I noticed you were unmuted before. Do you have something? Sure. Yeah. What makes me angry, I think, is the inequality in the world. Mm -hmm. Knowing that there's 40 or $50 trillion sitting out there in offshore bank accounts, well, that would go a long way to to relieving a lot of pain and suffering in the world and <clears throat> cleaning up polluted water and um, you know soil and air and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and I feel a personal responsibility to somehow reduce that inequality by being of service and helping, uh, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> as someone that has a lot of resources in their life and had a lot of uh, benefits, you know, utilizing my time and my resources to share with others and help others um, deal with their challenges. And what I love is, of course, the beauty of the world. 
and I just, it pains me to see it being destroyed and contaminated by thoughtless people and people who don't have any choice but to pollute because they simply don't have access to clean resources, let's say. So Thank you. that's worrisome. Thank you so much. And Leah, or Leah, I'm not sure which. <laughs> it's, it's Leah. Um, I think, and I, I, I'm sorry if this doesn't work with your, with your thing. I think behind my, my anger is fear. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. Fear for all of the, of my, for myself and for then my students and my nieces and nephews and people who I will never meet, uh, who have all of, we, we all want to live happy, productive lives, like, like generations of humans before us. And there's now a risk that we can't. Um, and so, that, so behind my anger is fear. And I think that works perfectly, Leah, because it, you just stated that you love life and that you love life for those people and for even the unknown people who are coming. So, yeah. Thank you. Julie, please. Well, I just think this is the most incredible planet. I just, it's, it's just such a gem, a beautiful gem floating in the universe. And it's very, it's probably very unique. There's got to be probably maybe thousands, maybe millions of other Earths in the, in the huge vast universe, but we don't know about them. And we do know about us and we know how special we are, at least in our realm of the universe. And it's, uh, it's breathtakingly a beautiful place. And to think that people treat it like a garbage dump is infuriating and makes me angry. Um, it would be make me angry if someone walked in my house and threw their garbage on my living room floor. And that's how I feel about people who throw cigarettes on my front lawn or, you know, throw gum out their car window when you're, <laughs> when they're traveling on the highways. And I just um, can't imagine treating the planet that way. So the, the anger that I feel kind of comes out of that awe that I feel for, for this place. And the, uh, it's uh, so remarkable that the thought of people uh, abusing it is appalling to me. Thank you. Jan, please. Well, my, my anger is kind of along those lines. I, I really hate to see people not respecting nature and fighting against it and man thinking that they're they can kill off species and destroy habitat just for their own selfish reasons and not realizing that nature sustains us all and that they have no respect for this. That makes me angry because I love the natural world and everyone needs their green spaces. It's good for your mental health in a lot of ways. And so people shouldn't be fighting nature. They should be promoting it and, and learning to live with the natural world. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to go back. I'm going to go back and tell another story, and then we'll do this again at another question in a couple of minutes. Okay, sharing my screen. So in 2019, as Greg said, I I got that. I got that. Um, it was 2018. Sorry, I finished in 2019 the work. But in 2018, I was working in Washington, D.C. at USAID, the United States Agency for International Development. I was an environmental policy advisor for, yep, for ASHA and for Food for Peace and traveling all over and doing um, a lot of work with environmental considerations. And I received an email about an opportunity in Thailand. There from the Phuket Hotels Association, but very specifically from the United States Embassy of Thailand, saying that they're on the island of Phuket, which is, um, it, it's a very, it's a very big touristy 
place on the planet. It's quite beautiful. Thailand is quite beautiful. However, Phuket was having trouble because there are 65 associated hotels in the Phuket Hotels Association on the island. There's more hotels than that, but figure 65-ish are the ones who are associated. And they were having problems bringing tourists to their hotels because every time the uh, the tide or the winds changed, different hotels had massive amounts of single-use plastics washing ashore of their five-star hotels. Well, no one wants to stay, no one wants to take an exotic vacation and stay at a five-star hotel only to go swimming in the ocean and have a dirty diaper stuck to your thigh or have a plastic bag wrap around your foot. And this is a human this is a human perspective, not that of a sea turtle or of a dolphin or something, you know, who lives in the ocean, knowing that this group would understand that at a much deeper level. They weren't necessarily thinking that. They were hotel people, hotel employees, hotel managers, hotel owners worried about their income and saying, okay, how can we bring more people in? So it just so happened that the environmental leader at the U.S. Embassy in Thailand was on vacation in Phuket, noticed all of the pollution on the beaches, and then noticed how many plastic water bottles they were given at the hotels where they were staying. He came forward and said, if you just, which is always a trigger for me, if, if every hotel just put a water fountain in their front lobby, everyone could bring their own container and fill it up on their way out and their way in. And we would save how many plastic water bottles? So that, although it was not in the same language that a, that a hotel speaks, was enough of an impetus to go to the Phuket Hotels Association and start a collaboration between the PHA, Phuket Hotels Association and the US Embassy of Thailand. They hired me as an environmental advisor to go and do this work. So I was already aware of ocean plastics. I was aware of the problem and I was a major single use plastic user, right? Living and working in Washington DC, living and working a very fast life, traveling a lot and relying on single use plastics with a broken heart every time, but for my life to continue. So I realized that I got this position and thought, oh my goodness, I thought of that Mahatma Gandhi story. I'm sure most of you have heard of this, right? But I'll just repeat it here um, just in case you haven't. So Mahatma Gandhi, this, this woman, uh, her child, her son is eating too much sugar. So she packs him up on a train and the two of them travel across India and sit down behind, be, before Mahatma Gandhi. And they say, um, Gandhi ji, would you please tell my son to stop eating sugar? And he thinks about it for a little while and he sends them home. He says, come back in two weeks. So they go back, you know, it's like a two day trip every single time. So they go back, they live their life. Then they pack up again and come back. They sit in front of Mahatma Gandhi again. And he looks at the boy and he says, son, stop eating sugar. And then the mom and the son are leaving. And she says, hang on, hang on one second. Gandhiji, why? Why did you? I mean, that was so easy. Why didn't you just tell us this two weeks ago? And he looked at the mother and said, in order for me to tell your son to stop eating sugar, I had to give up sugar. Right? So. When I got this position in Thailand, I decided, oh my goodness, I have about two months to prepare. I have to give up single-use plastics before I tell 65 hotels to stop using single-use plastics. So I went, I, I do a lot of grocery shopping. I, it's one of my favorite things to do. And so I'm, I always think I could win the prices right in natural food shopping uh, if that was a thing. Anyway, so just something about me. So here I was in a grocery store the very day that I decided to no longer buy single use plastics in the fruit and vegetable department, looking around thinking, I really want some raspberries. It was the summertime, you know, or summer was coming and and I looked and I thought, oh no, there, there's two, there's two plastics in there. There's this little thing at the bottom and then there's the actual, oh, I can't buy that. Okay. 
Well, then I'll get it frozen. No, that comes in a plastic bag. Okay. So I start feeling anxiety. Can I buy strawberries? No. Blueberries? No. I see a lot of no's in front of me. And I start looking. I say, oh, bananas. There was no plastic on those bananas. Some, some bananas come with plastic. And then I turned to mangoes. Okay. Mangoes don't have plastic. Okay. And I started seeing possibilities, right? Then I went home and I was really obsessed with this idea. And I started Googling if there were any local farmers who grew raspberries, could I bring my own container? Right. And slowly I found solutions for that. And then I started dissecting more and more. Like, like I went to a restaurant with a friend and got food, didn't eat it all. Thought, oh my goodness, they're going to give me a plastic or heaven forbid a styrofoam container. What could I have done better? And I created a, a small bag that I called my monster bag. And it is, I, Greg, I promised you I would have it. It's in my car right now. I can always run out and get it. But I keep it in my car and it never leaves. It has three to-go containers, a mug, a napkin, a fork, a knife, a spoon that are bamboo. It's got all sorts of things in there to, to set myself up for success so that if I'm in a situation, I can just not only say no to the single-use plastic, but I can also educate with kindness, right? And say, oh, do you mind using this? I really try not to use single-use plastic because so much of it washes ashore, blows out of landfills, blows out of trucks, et cetera, et cetera. So I started taking action like this and I did it for two months, got sent to Phuket, Thailand. And and commenced the journey of telling 65 hotels what to do and how to reduce their single use plastic. So one thing that I found before I started this journey is that as I was using, you know, mountains of single use plastic on a daily basis, I would simply blame others. I would sit on, you know, sit, walk, stand on my soapbox. It's a very normal thing, I think, for us to do and say, well, if they just gave me something different, then I could do better, but they don't. And so it's their fault. And honestly, my go-to is corporations. They make a lot of profit. They make a lot of money. I've heard it from a couple of you. It's an easy blame, right? And one of the things I realized in this whole, let's say, spectrum of work from, okay, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to be sent to Thailand. Now I'm going to give up single-use plastics as much as I possibly can, dissect my life. Then I'm going to tell other people to give up single-use plastics, and then I'm going to help them dissect their life. All of a sudden, I found myself in front of hotel owners, hotel CEOs, who had never even considered this as a problem, let alone any of the solutions. Is that an issue? Sure. Should they be better? Yes, of course. However, they're doing the best they can. Their best might not be very good, but they're doing the best they can. If that's true, then I can help them, right? But not until I can look at them judgment-free and say, oh, that one was really hard for me. Here's what I figured out, right? Um, here's a great, here's, here's an example. Hotels, use, you can't imagine, I, I did the math, how many uh, plastic bags they use in trash. So I was not at, you know, two, three star hotels. I was at five star hotels. So if there is a single hair in a garbage bag, they take the whole garbage bag and landfill it and put in a new garbage bag, right? It's got to be five star. So I looked at the CEO of this hotel chain and said, and I had done the math at how many plastic bags he, he, he was a man, this, you know, this company uses in a year. And I said, what if you went to zero bags and you washed them in, you washed the containers instead. And he looked at me and I said, you're saving money here because I've, you know, I've seen the bins in the back. I, I know that you washed them anyway. I know this, I know that. And what do you think about the possibility? And he, he straight up said, yes, that's, uh, that's great. I can do that, right? You're going to save us money. Great. So my point is, before I had started the journey 
all I did was look at that same CEO, who obviously I didn't know at the time, and judged him for making these choices. But then as I grew kind of awareness and process, I could look at him and say, you know, I didn't think of this one either. Because by this time, there was so much going on that that uncovered itself through action. So we're going to open it up to the group again. I hope all of this makes sense. I'm going to stop sharing and ask, this one might be redundant. So we might be able to actually jump to the next question, unless you want to talk about blame. But the next question is, what is one thing you can change in your life before convincing anyone else to change? So it's, so it's another two-part question. Who do you blame? And what is one thing you can change to learn the nuances in order to, um, in order to convince others to change? Does that question make sense? Okay. So, I'm, so it's now open. Okay, well, I'll take a crack at this. Um, who do I blame is really difficult. I guess basically what I blame is the nature of people. Having thought about this for many years and observing people's behavior, I'm a psychologist by training. I've watched, well, first of all, myself from, from the background that I came from uh, being uh, lower middle class, I guess, we weren't poor, but we didn't have a lot of resources. But my observation was that uh, as I acquired resources, my behavior uh, reflected, uh, you know, my ability to acquire, I don't know, things so much, but certainly to live a, what was presented to us as the good life. So, um, you know, uh, Ozzy and Harriet and uh, that sort of lifestyle. Um, but beyond that, I've watched other people who have um, come from other societies, other parts of the world, and have moved into the Western world, either in Europe or in, in the States, um, in Asia, and I observed how their behaviors have changed uh, as they've acquired resources. Uh, by resources, I mean, I, basically, I mean money, I guess, the ability to acquire, acquire what they want. And um, so I don't see a whole lot of difference in that behavior, depending upon where you grew up. Um, so I, I've, you know, looking at it, it seems like it's, it's, it's kind of a basic tenant of human nature. And it takes a bit of work to overcome it, quite a bit of work, actually. And um, fitting into society, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, what, what we used to call doggy bags. Um, and the idea of walking into a restaurant uh, seven, eight years ago with, a, uh, with your own takeaway container when you go out for dinner, especially a nice restaurant seemed really bizarre. And it really seemed bizarre to give that to the uh, uh, waiter or waitress and um, ask them to put your, your leftovers in it. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a major psychological thing that uh, I've seen uh, in, in many people. Thank and you. in myself in particular. Thanks. George. Now, who do you blame? You know, and um, you know, I, I think back to my childhood and, people threw everything out of the car window, you know, and also I've had the opportunity to travel a lot. And in poor countries, the littering, the how the rivers are, it's like, can't these, don't these people know, you know? But I really got woken up by, by a friend of mine, President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. And, and, and we were meeting and, and he brought up the subject that, you know, my people, they litter. You know, our country looks dirty. And he thought it through and he said, my people cannot read the sign that says don't litter. 
And so he embarked upon a national literacy program that brought them from the bottom to the top in one year. And resultantly, it cleaned up the country. You know, and so that's kind of like, where, where is the base problem here? You know, what are, what, are, what are the associations that come into this? And so I just wanted to share that with you. That's a great story. Thank you, George. That's a great point. I've been thinking a lot about the, the upstream, what's happening. And there's actually, um, not to take away from this discussion, but there's a podcast that I would love to share with you all. I'm putting it in the chat right now. And it's a Canadian scientist, Dr. Max Liboiron, who studies ocean plastics and the explanation of what she does and what her team does and how they tackle this issue. It's just amazing. And the way that she describes, does she, does she recycle? Yes. Does she think it's helping? No, it's not upstream enough. And it's, it's just, it's just wonderful. I listened to it twice already. I think I'll listen to it another 10 times. It's so well done. So, yeah. Julie, would you like to? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the blame goes uh, equally to the producers of all this plastic crap and the consumers. I think that is an awful lot of money being made off of plastic production. Um, and of course, the use of fossil fuels is what plastic comes from. And so I, I, I never realized that plastic was made from plus from oil until several years back. And then you go to the grocery store and they say, what do you want? Paper or plastic for your bag? And so you think, well, do I want paper that's going to deplete the rainforest or the, the forest? Or do I want uh, uh, plastic that's going to, you know, come from the oil supplies? And then so at some point I think, well, maybe I'd rather have plastic and let's get rid of as much oil as possible so we don't have more oil wars. You know, I mean, we started fighting all these wars over oil. Let's just use it up and get rid of the damn stuff. Yeah, then we'd be better off without it. But then, of course, all of this pollution starts coming to the surface and the tragedy of the oceans and the fact that the people who are making all of this money off of plastic production know damn well what's happening to those oceans and the, the terrible crisis the oceans are in because of their production of this stuff. And yet they keep advertising and advertising and enticing people to buy things off, not offering you any options uh, when you go to shop and look all the searching you had to do to try to find some options. And um, I think, you know, it's there's tremendous blame on that end and it's mainly profit motive stuff. But when it comes to us, we have to be firm and we have to be strong and we have to be creative to say no to that. And even on an aesthetic level, I'd rather, I only would buy wooden toys for my kids. I would refuse to buy wooden toys when they were little. Wow. Um, and plastic toys, I didn't, I wouldn't buy plastic toys. Uh, the same, like, I, I don't have like vinyl or plastic countertops. I have a wooden countertop in my kitchen. Um, I just think there is so many things you can opt for that are aesthetically more beautiful if they're a natural, a natural um, wooden or other kind of, uh, of element. Sure. So it's, it's got to go hand in hand, but we do have to take responsibility for our choices and stand up to the big corporate profit motives. And I hear you say also probably, um, you know, woven in there is teaching, right? Kindly spreading the message oh, so yeah. that people are aware you know, the example you gave before the meeting started or, or right at the beginning of the meeting, going mm -hmm. into Chase Bank and communicating kindly, please, you know, please send this message on up. Yeah. Here's what we believe and here's what we yeah. follow. And yeah. there is a really good organization here in Milwaukee that's uh, taking on plastic, single-use plastics and, yes. and doing it, you know, restaurant by restaurant, kind of, and getting people to, or bar by bar, stop using plastic straws and and they're making an inroad, so it's important. Yeah. Great, and and Leah. 
I'm not this this doesn't exactly answer the question, but I think it's very important to not blame this. I don't think I don't think it's helpful or useful or or good to blame like people who use plastic straws. That is not a, not appropriate. Like um, a lot of people with disabilities have to use have to use straws to drink. And so if plastic is the only straw available, that's what they're going to use because otherwise they can't drink. Um, and I'm, and uh, if you think about the price of a fancy wooden toy versus a plastic toy, um, the plastic toy is so much cheaper. And are we saying that children shouldn't have toys if they, if they, um, the parents of those children should stand up and not buy toys if they can't afford wooden toys. I think it's not it's not fair to blame to place the place the responsibility on individuals to fix the systemic problem. Mm. Um, so, yeah, in my life, I make choices to not buy not to try not to buy single use plastics to try not to buy um, new clothes and all sorts of things, but. I, I try really hard not to stand on it. Not think that makes me it makes me any kind of special. Um, because, as you said, Dr. Jablonski, everybody's just doing the best that they can. Thank you. Well, that is that is a perfect statement that will lead us into the next. What you just showed us is empathy and compassion, and one of the one of the things that we all have is empathy and compassion we can all make exceptions for people we love and we can all make exceptions for ourselves which means we can do this as a collaborative we can we can create a team and we can be less judgmental and stay a little more sane and burn out a little slower let's say or hopefully not burn out at all okay i'm going to share my screen again We'll keep plugging away here. So I showed up in Phuket and heard two things. On my first, this happened on the at the very first hotel I visited. Marissa, you just work with the governments and the corporations and change policy, make big change. This is how it's going to happen, right? Uh, and then the other half said, uh, it's all us. We need to use less single-use plastics. And that's that's the way the implementation has to happen on the ground up. And you'll never guess who said what, right? People who could make everyday change said, go to the government, um, go to the corporations, make policy change. And when I would go visit the government and the corporations, they would say, if people would create less demand, then then we would manufacture less, right? So we have this push and pull and where it leads me to is realizing, okay, if we have a push and a pull, then that means we're both right. And most likely change needs to happen from both places. So what can change look like is my question. So for me, it began by making short little videos. I'm talking five seconds to a minute long videos on social media about raising awareness. And they always end in yay, go team. Cause I was sick and tired of the crying and the sadness and the, cause it's real, right? I spent many times, uh, many days laying in bed thinking this is hopeless. So I, I switched the narrative and thought, okay, what examples can we think of? And I often ask in my videos, what do you do? What works for you? And how can we communicate better about this so that we're not blaming each other, so that we're not blaming the consumer, so that we're not even blaming the corporation. We're just holding all of us accountable in this really neat way that the, the corporation does better, the consumer demands more. That's, it's a lovely thought. It's a little optimistic, but I still stand by it. So what did that look like? So what does this look like in Thailand? So I did those videos, I got rolling, showed up in Thailand. And the very first thing I was told is policy versus uh, action. And then I was told, if you just give us data, Marissa, 
will change our mind. And I looked at the head of the Phuket Hotels Association who told me that. And I said, what's interesting, her name is Sumi and she's a terrific friend of mine. But I said, Su now she is after working together. But I said, Sumi, we all know that we use a million plastic bags every minute. We all know we use a, mi a million plastic bottles every minute. And that's every minute of every day and every night. That data is out there. Here, data handed over. And yet we still do it. We still do it. And so I beg to differ. I actually think you don't need data. So the first step was data because it was demanded. The second step is I said, we need to host workshops, weekly workshops to gather, inform, and share information and, and grow our team. There are a lot of people, I'm specifically talking about hotels here, but there are a lot of people in industry who simply go to work, do their job, and they don't think about ocean plastics. They were not born environmentalists. They were born something else. Economists, plumbers, electricians, I don't know, a million other things, right? There's 7.5, probably 8 billion people on planet Earth. That we're all different humans. So they have different, maybe they're chefs, maybe they're gardeners, maybe they're, I mean, the sky's the limit here. So we needed workshops. And I told this to the Phuket Hotels Association and said, can we do this? And I was told that's going to be really difficult. Nobody has time for a workshop. Nobody's going to show up. And I said, if we pitch it right and say, this will help reduce your outflow of plastics into the ocean. And, and it will be a selling point to bring in consumers or tourists. And she looked at me, Sumi looked at me uh, very skeptically. And I said, Here, here's a deal. Let's throw one next Wednesday. If people show up, we'll throw a second, you know, we'll, we'll throw one every single week while I'm here. So eight workshops. If no one shows up and it's a total flop, I'll give you your data, create a report and get out of town. It was packed and tons of fun. And they left with action items and information and it was, it was a hit. So this was really important and it wasn't depressing. It really was, okay, we know there's a problem. How do we solve it? And we couldn't solve it overnight, but it was using the same kind of idea that what lives inside of you, how do you make that grow? How do you give, give words to that? The third thing we did was share best practices. I created a catalog of items that looks kind of like this picture in here. So for instance, in a hotel, when a banquet is set up, everyone's given water. So the old way is everyone gets a single use plastic water bottle at their seat. So then they might open it once and drink a sip. And then not only the water, but also the plastic goes to the back. The next step up is you put all the plastic water bottles in the corner. And if you really want water, you have to get up out of your chair, go walk and pick up your water. They saved a lot of plastic water bottles that way. The third step when I came in was we need a water dispenser. And the fourth step was returnable glass bottles, replacing every single plastic water bottle in 45 of the 65 hotels. They committed to do this in 2018, saving 6 million plastics uh, plastic water bottles in six months. So it's still not enough, right? We use 6 million plastic bottles every minute. 6 million is six minutes, not enough, but a tiny little example and a tiny little step forward. So it was meeting people where they were celebrating. Yes, good job. You're thinking to put the plastic water bottles back in the corner. Can you do more? What do you think about the water dispenser? Then they said things like, a five-star hotel can't have a water dispenser. Oh, I didn't know that. Great. Can you use a returnable? Thailand has that infrastructure. And can we in the United States grow that infrastructure again? Or does it equate to uh, more gas mileage and, I'm sorry, more gas usage because ga uh, glass is so heavy to transport? So all of these pieces had to come together. And had I come to the table saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, they wouldn't have brought their honest feedback 
and actually shared and said, oh, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. So we came up with these two alternatives. And then we created this catalog. And what I like the most is up at the top, it says level of impact, large level of feasibility, easy. So someone can flip through this catalog and say, I want to have a large impact and I want it to be easy. There's going to be a handful of things you can do in your life or in a hotel that are like that. The majority are small impact, hard to do. So those we call, you know, top of the tree, not low hanging fruit. So you do those tomorrow. You don't work on those today. You fix the easy stuff first and keep your eye at the top of the tree. And before you know it, there's going to be a ladder in front of you, but you won't know, you won't even be able to find the ladder today, if that makes sense. The fourth thing we did was we engaged environmental champions. This was a really neat thing and super fun. You can tell we're all having tons of fun. So at every hotel we visited, we found, I, as I was doing a plastics audit at the hotels, I would find one person who was leaning in a lot and who was saying, well, what about this? What about this? You know, I do this at home. I bring my own coffee cup. I do this. I, and I thought, oh, so I started asking them, do you want to join an environmental champions group on WhatsApp on, you know, on a, on a group text? And they said, yeah, I really don't like how much plastics we're using. So they all of a sudden became in charge of these duties and it gave them respect and their manager was on board and grew their responsibility and helped move them up in their job. They could put it on their resume. It was exciting, it was fun. And then the last thing we did is probably the most important in the long run, creating an open source purchasing spreadsheet on Google, Google Spreadsheets or Google Sheets. And this was something that is now owned by the Phuket Hotels Association. They updated and any one of the environmental champions can go in here and add uh, an item, a description, the contact, so they know who to call from the purchasing, uh, for, oh, I'm sorry, from the hotels. So who put that item up there, then who's the supplier and the contact info for the supplier. So what this created was an incentive for two things. The, probably the biggest one is those suppliers. If, if one hotel is happy with your paper straw, that's why I put this up here. So straws were a really big thing. In Thailand, uh, it is a cultural, I don't know, acceptance or cultural thing to use plastic straws, especially with women. It's complicated and I am not Thai and I don't understand the depth of this, but it was a very, very common occurrence. And I had a manager look at me and say, how could I make a woman with beautiful makeup and perfect lipstick put her lips directly on a glass? She deserves a straw. So as soon as someone talks like that, I know this is culture. This, this hits deep, I'm not gonna change that belief. We need to change the straw, right? I'm not gonna convince anyone anything different. Metal straws are known to chip teeth and glass straws break in industri industrial kitchens. Silicone straws are an alternative to plastic straws, but their waste management is really tough and sanitation, you can't heat them because they are a type of plastic, even though they're silicone. What we ended up doing is relying on bamboo. We were in Thailand, bamboo grows everywhere. This particular manager who was dead set on plastic straws, he looked at me and he said, wait, there's a community that's looking for jobs for their elderly. They grow bamboo. What if we bought our bamboo from them, gave them money, helped the local community and got us bamboo straws? I said, can you give them away as a souvenir? You know, that way you don't have to um, you don't have to disinfect them because uh, that's very tough in a hotel setting, setting a lot of moisture and to be honest, coconut juice gets stuck on the inside. So it's a really tough situation. And they said, oh, that's a great idea. Bamboo really grows like weeds here. I said, yeah. So we went back and forth and back and forth. And it all came from this, uh, from this even playing field because I wasn't judging them. We were honestly trying to solve the problem. And like I said before, by the time I got up to the CEOs, we had solved enough problems 
that saved the company's money, that the CEOs were willing to consider other changes that in fact would cost a little more, but they had saved money here. So they would consider it. So that was really great. The, at the end of it all, at the beginning of it all, at the center of it all is people. I'll never forget one of the, I was probably the 20th hotel I went to. There was a young man who was very concerned. He turned into an environmental champion and he, he looked at me and he said, Marissa, I just don't understand. I don't throw my garbage into the ocean. My family doesn't throw their garbage into the ocean. Who is throwing their garbage into the ocean? With full curiosity and an open heart, right? He wanted to know who to blame and also how to solve the problem quickly. So I explained there are holes in the waste management system. There are, you know, there's a lot going on here that we can't plug all the holes, but we are trying to do as best we can, thus raising awareness along the way so that we can all do our part. And then I also started to explain uh, something that I've learned over the years. So it's really truly only when we change our own behavior. So when I change me, it is noticeable to those around me. And then my family starts to change. Once my family changes, maybe my inner community starts to change. Once they change, maybe my work starts to change. Once my work changes, maybe my bigger neighborhood starts to change. Then the city, then the state, then the country, then the world, right? But it all starts at self. And hopefully we know enough people and we influence enough with kindness and an open heart that these changes do equate to something on a larger scale. That's my wish. That's my dream. That's my hope. Because it's amazing. I mean, uh, let's see, people know when I'm around, they bring up plastics. So for instance, I sail with some friends of mine, they have a sailing boat, they have a sailboat, and they take me out uh, on these race days. And I was invited to do an overnight race. And for maybe 20 years, 25 years, everyone got sandwiches and single use plastic bags. The year I went on, they were in tinfoil, they were in Tupperware or glass con reusable containers, and they were in wax paper. And they said, Marissa's on board, we need to change. This year, I wasn't able to do, it was the Queen's Cup, I wasn't able to do it. And they got one plastic bag for the entire, you know, it's like 36 hours or something. Not as good as last year, because I wasn't on, but they're still thinking about it, right? So we do have ripple effects. Here's another instance. When I go to the grocery store, the way that I got myself to stop getting plastic bags ever is I, I think about this uh, with dating. So my partner, he didn't like this, that I would do this. But if I forgot my plastic bags, I would say, okay, Mike, we're carrying it together. And he would say, oh, please don't make me. And I would say, we're never going to forget our bags again right? And we didn't. It happens once, maybe twice, and you never forget your bags again. And then all of a sudden, I would get a phone call from Mike at the grocery store saying, you'll never believe how many plastic bags the person in front of me just used. And I'll say, is there a way to say, oh, here, would you like to use one of my bags? You can have it. I have about 20 at home. They give this stuff away at conferences. You know, this is, we use a million plastic bags every minute and every plastic bag we don't use sends a message. I understand that not everybody can do this today, but maybe, maybe your kids will like to help you by carrying the plastic bags to the car. And whoever gives you a plastic bag, I always make sure to thank them. Thank you so much for trying to serve me, for to trying, to make, trying to make my life easier. The thing is, this plastic bag will be useful for 10 minutes and then it will end up in the ocean, in the Great Lakes, in the rivers, in a tree. It will haunt my life. And so I prefer no plastic, but thank you so much, no bag. 
And you better believe it's really hard to do certain things with me because I'm like a circus trainer, right? I'm trying to pay for the groceries and trying to pack my own bags and trying to make sure everything happens without plastic. You do that enough with enough of your friends and they catch on and they do it too. So, but the key is to do it with kindness. My mom is a great example. She's trying so, so hard, but she'll look at someone straight in the grocery store and say, we don't use plastic bags. And I'm like, and thank you very much for trying to make us so happy by giving us something to carry our stuff in, right? So it's, it's this dance because we are dancing with frustration and anger and love and blame and pride and change. So this is a complex situation that we're dealing with, and that's why it's such a such a um, such an emotional thing. So I think we need to look at time check here. Yeah, where are uh, we at? 20. Yeah. So we have about ten minutes left, and uh, perhaps there's some specific questions that people would like to raise for you. Yeah. Yeah, Tim. I'll make a question quick. I was interested when the when the person said, where does all that plastic come from? Yeah. And um, all I can say is, uh, yeah, where does it come from? It can't just be individuals that throw a straw in a creek and it gets in a river and it goes to the ocean. It has to be huge municipalities dumping huge trucks loads and huge ships dumping tr uh, boat loads. Uh, because I, I was amazed to see that sea of garbage. It can't just cut, be coming from uh, a, a, a bunch of individuals. Right. It, it's got to be a municipal garbage or a regional garbage collection system that has to change also. I mean, I agree with the individual totally. for a number of reasons, but it's more systematic than that, in my yeah. opinion. Oh, oh gosh, in everyone's opinion. And please don't take what I just said as, uh, yes, you have to work on yourself, but do it with the intention that you will be getting somewhere and making much larger change, right? Because we, the individual can do such a small fraction of what some of these municipal and corporate entities can accomplish. And so please um, know that the message I am sending is yes, we need to make gigantic change. And until we understand all of the ins and outs of the issue, we won't get there. So I agree, there needs to be policy change, there needs to be regulations, there needs to be municipal change. So uh, let's see, I'll give you three examples of how, how it gets there. Uh, yes, there is some boat dumping. The United States ships most of our garbage, I shouldn't say that, most of our recycling. This made the news, what, about, was it 18 months ago, I want to say, maybe two years. I, I lost track a little bit in there. But um, we ship most of our recycling uh, overseas to be recycled, when in reality, it's being, it's being stored and sometimes dumped in the ocean. So in my opinion, we need to stop designating something as recycled until it is recycled and remanufactured into another item. That to me is recycled. It's not recycled when I put it in a bin. And we could start by re-educating children and redefining recycling. You know, um, okay, how else does it get there? Physical gaps in the trucks. So when something is put into a garbage bin or a recycling bin that isn't in a bag, I have to be honest, I do not put my recycling in a bag. They don't want it in a plastic bag. And I don't take paper bags. So I don't know how else to do this. But when the truck lifts up the truck lifts up my my bin. And if the wind blows just right, you better believe garbage is getting thrown out. So all of my garbage is in as heavy as possible. I know that sounds weird. Tied garbage bags. Sometimes it's not very heavy, right? If I'm not throwing out anything heavy, I compost. So there's nothing wet in my garbage. So um, but the idea is to contain it as best we can so that it gets into the truck. Not everyone knows this, 
So maybe they have loose garbage. They dump the garbage. The wind blows just right. Half their garbage is strewn across the, the, the you know, street, the alley, the yard. It ends up, keep on blowing, goes to the lowest point, which is our waterway. We are 7.5 to 8 billion people on planet Earth. So if, I, if it's happening to my garbage, it's happening to many, Tim. So that's, that's a, a measure of scale. And then the third thing is, yes, many, many communities have zero waste management zero there i do a lot of work with engineers without borders and we do work in guatemala and i i bring about 10 students to rural parts of guatemala for two weeks every january and i wake up earlier than all of them and have hot tea you know one place we stayed was right on the river and starting at 4 4 30 a.m uh, women come and they take their bag of trash and they throw it in the river the river goes downstream Oof. Why do they do that, right? George's example, George's story about Venezuela is a perfect one. They do it because they're not aware. So I actually want to share one slide before, um, before our time is completely up because I think it's important. But if, because I was going to take the conversation into a million different places, but um but the challenge is not just number one, what single use plastic are you giving up today and for the next year? That's a really fun challenge. It took me an entire year to figure out face lotion. An entire year to find, I have sensitive skin. I finally found the right kind of oil that comes in a glass jar. It took a year, it, it, I, it was a game for me, right? But then the second is what are you doing? And I know 350.org is political. So what are you doing to engage government policies, government offices, uh, the sustainability office in Milwaukee? I am this close to calling them after this July 4th and the amount of waste I saw along the lakeshore. The third, what are you doing to work with children? There's not a child on the planet that pollution makes sense to. So when you talk composting to a child, they get it and you better believe they want to go do it. I, when I was five, I learned about, that was the first earth day I ever celebrated. I learned about composting. I went home and I said, dad, why are we throwing our food waste into the landfill? He was 35 at the time. He looked at me, he said, I didn't know we're doing that. What should we do instead? I said, compost. We still have that compost pile right? The way to change is through children because they don't understand constraints that adults make up and live by. So these are, um, so political, local education. I think those are really important pieces. Tom. Yeah, I, I listening to what you're talking about uh, got me focused in, okay, there's too many things going on in the world. I'm, I'm working on too many issues. What one thing can I do in response to your talking about? And this is what I'm going to do. And I've been thinking about this a while. My dog is a great friend of mine. We go out walking a couple, three times a day. <clears throat> There's plastic bags designed to just clean up after. <clears throat> I saw in Consumer Reports, we can use a brown paper bag. As well. And so that's what I'm going to do. Next time I'm to the store, I'm going to get brown paper bags that I can clean up after my dog. That's the one thing I'm going to do in relationship to this discussion. And then I'll, I'll worry about the rest of it later. Thanks, Tom. I also, if you want to take it one step further, you can get a pooper picker upper, like a, like a, yep. And then create a dog poop compost pile. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information online. Paper bags, great. You can, uh, that that might be the end of the line would be composting. Another thing is to flush it down your toilet. Although that is controversial. I posted something, I started doing that and someone said, dogs carry different bacteria than we carry. And I said, yeah, but the wastewater treatment facility can handle it. So there's, there's controversy about the, the flushing, but great idea, Tom. Yay, go team, really, a good job, yes. <clears throat> It looks like George, your hand is up. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Great presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted. <clears throat> so, policy implementation. You're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I said great presentation, Marissa. Thanks, you know, the, what struck me is your chart that had policy on top and implementation and policies, government implementation is corporations or organizations. And as Tom said, we were, we were fighting so many things. I just want to bring up one critical thing, campaign finance. It's the implementation in the feeds of policy that doesn't change in this country. You know, in other countries, they call it corruption. Yes. You know, I'm getting so much money from a corporation or the fossil fuel industry that I go against the humanity of my own constituents. That's corruption. So I just want to remind people, anytime finance, campaign finance comes up, don't ignore it. If we're going to get some change, that has to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. <laughs> I also want to respond to Mark's question. Recycle caps on or off? It depends on your municipality. Isn't that a shame? So the podcast that I posted in the chat, it's called For the Wild Podcast, Dr. Max Liboyron on orientating within a world of plastic is a excellent around 40 minutes. It was 38 to somewhere in there, 38 to 40 minutes. I was walking the dog. It, it describes the reason that plastics, one of the major reasons plastics are not all recycled or recyclable is because they are often proprietary and uh, proprietary chemical, let's call them mixes that create these polymers to create the container that is benefiting that company. So when they melt it down with other ones, they can or cannot use it basically. So it's a disaster area. Talk about a policy change. I am constantly brainstorming on how to enter into this industry and say, okay, here's what we can do. What about someone coming out with, you know, PET is a really recyclable plastic. It can become clothing and it can become all sorts of things. Um, uh, so how do we convince industry to streamline this and then take their waste back for goodness sake they did that in germany and it worked you know if we could all just throw all of our garbage all of our packaging back into the usps boxes and it would get delivered right back to the companies whoo that would do that would do a lot because they would have to deal with it um the other thing that i loved in this podcast i can't stress it enough is there are a couple of organizations that are labeling the waste that's picked up by the company that did it, right? So if they have an ocean or a beach cleanup, they will label it, oh, we found 31,000 pieces of Coca-Cola plastic. We found 81,000 pieces of Unilever plastic. What are you going to do about it, Unilever? What are you going to do about a Coca-Cola? I think those kind of messages are very, very strong. Rather than saying 14,000 caps, because Pepsi is maybe using a different plastic than Coca-Cola, than Nestle, et cetera. And so, Mark, I'm so sorry that I don't have the answer. It has everything to do with the municipality you're in, and sometimes even the recycling center who takes it. And it is... Uh, a ghastly shame i'm being honest but um but there is hope you know yeah policy education kids that's really you know the kids is the key thanks a ton thank you so much it's now after 8 30 um several minutes and we do have to close down but i think we uh learned so much from you and appreciate your work immensely and it certainly is a challenge, a very personal challenge for all of us, because there's nobody online tonight that isn't challenged by this in their lives. So uh, we ought to check in with each other now and then and see how we're doing. And perhaps uh, at some other meetings, we can quickly share some more ideas on how we can, uh, can handle this in our own lives. So thank you so much, Marissa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've also, I know that Greg will put my website and, you know, my Instagram posts, uh, link, sorry, in the newsletter and in any kind of emails that go out, but also just reach out to me if you do have questions. I may be able to share, you know, how I look at things. And when I put those, that website together, Amazon was 
the, well, you'll see it. It's on there. It, it was a solution that I found and I recognize on there that it is not the solution. I do not like supporting Amazon. However, uh, I was speaking to an audience in Washington, D.C. who moved fast and saw nothing wrong with Amazon. So just know that there is no perfect. We are all showing up and we're doing the best we can. And because we know more, we do more. So we're in this together. Thank, Thank you. Good so inspirational much. saying. Very. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thanks so much. Stay well. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night.